having been plain about it with the voters and the voters having heard the choices and made a choice, do you think it's also the case that a senator in that hypothetical state should come to the body and do what he said he was going to do to his voters? Well, I appreciate the question from the senator from Virginia, and I think he raises a very good point and a fair point. Uh, and I think that point is particularly valid for those senators, and I would note that all three of the senators in the chambers right now, in the chamber right now, were elected in 2012. I think the point that he raises is particularly valid for those of us who were running in 2012, when this, this was an issue before the voters. Now, in the hypothetical you gave, which I'm not sure is entirely hypothetical, what I don't know is the exact representations that candidate made to the voters of his or her state. The exact statements that candidate made, I absolutely agree that we should honor the commitments made to the people. I would also note that, that all of us have an obligation to take note of changed circumstances, to take note of new facts that come to light, and even honoring your commitments does not mean that you ignore changed circumstances. To give an example, prior to World War II, there were quite a few members of this body in the House of Representatives who campaigned and said, we will keep America out of the war. Following Pearl Harbor, it was a different circumstance. It was a changed circumstance. And I think quite reasonably, People change their views, the constituents change their views, and the representatives change their views based on changed circumstances. And so I would submit, listen, the argument you make is a serious one, and I would not encourage any member of this body to disregard the commitments they made to their constituents. But I would at the same time encourage every member, not just to keep in mind the promises made on the campaign trail, but the ongoing views of your constituents, because as circumstances change, all of us respond to change circumstances, including our constituents. And so Agreed. one must certainly respect the promises made, but at the same time, in the nine months we've been here, in the year since the three of us were active candidates, the situation in Obamacare has changed. Look, I very much opposed Obamacare a year ago, two years ago, and three years ago. The time it was passed, I thought it was a bad idea. But a year ago, the unions didn't oppose it. A year ago, the president hadn't granted exemptions for big corporations. A year ago, members of Congress hadn't gone to the president, asked for an exemption, and gotten it. A year ago, we hadn't seen companies all over this country forcing people into 29 hours a week. A year ago, we hadn't seen one big corporation after another dropping their health insurance coverage, such as UPS telling 15,000 employees your spousal coverage is being dropped because of Obamacare, your husbands and wives have just lost their coverage. So I, I would submit, Mr. President, that the circumstances have changed. And the, and the last thing I'd ask, uh, Senator, is the three senators who are now in the chamber are each from different states. We all ran in 2012. I don't know about the the presiding officer situation, I was in that hypothetical, as you understand, running against a candidate who promised to repeal Obamacare. I promised to work on reform efforts, um, but to reject any effort to repeal or to fund Obamacare. The voters of Virginia chose the candidate who was not for repeal of Obamacare. I don't know if it was the same situation in the Connecticut or not. I suspect that it probably was. We each represent one state. There was also a national election in 2012 um, between a candidate, a president, who said that the Affordable Care Act was the law of the land and I'm willing to work on it and improve it, but I will fight against efforts to repeal it or to fund it, and a candidate who pledged to repeal the Affordable Care Act. A and an election result in a presidential election is listening to America, I believe. I'm, I'm a believer in this system. I'm a, I'm a believer in small-d democracy and the power of presidential elections and mandates. And I think the, res the result in that election between the candidate who promised to maintain the Affordable Care Act and work to improve it and the candidate who promised to repeal the Affordable Care, Care Act 
was not particularly close. I think it was a 53 to 47 percent election among the large, sizable national electorate rejecting the repeal, the Affordable Care Act position. Is, is that something that this body should at least consider or take into account as we wrestle with this question? Well, I appreciate the question from the senator from Virginia as well. And look, there's no doubt President Obama was reelected. I wish he had not been. I obviously did not support his election, but majority of the American people voted for him to be reelected, and that is to his credit. I would point out that I do not agree with one of the premises of the questions, question proposed by the senator from Virginia, which is namely that the national election was fought over Obamacare. I think the national election, number one, President Obama is a spectacularly talented candidate, a far more talented candidate than the Republican candidate, who I think Mitt Romney is a good and decent man, but not the political candidate that Barack Obama is. But number two, once we got to the general election, much to my great dismay, Republicans didn't make this election about Obamacare. And in fact, if you contrast the elections in 2010 and 2012, 2012, Republicans ran all over the country on let's stop Ob Obamacare in 2010. And the result was a tidal wave election for Republicans in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. It resulted in new personnel in both places. It resulted in Republicans taking over the House of Representatives. It resulted in a significant number of new Republicans in this body. In 2012, Republicans did not focus, indeed, in the general election did not make nearly as much of an issue about Obamacare and how it's failing the American people as they should have. And as a consequence, I think an awful lot of people stayed home. Now, I will commend the Obama campaign. They did a fabulous job of mobilizing their supporters, their voters, and that's, that's part of what politics is about. They also did a very good job of focusing on a lot of issues other than Obamacare. And indeed, I would suggest to the senator from Virginia that if the premise of your question were correct, then President Obama would have campaigned on, I passed Obamacare. Vote for me and let's preserve Obamacare. We would have seen TV ads saturating, this is the signature achievement. And it was very interesting, that was not the campaign President Obama ran. There was almost a bipartisan agreement not to mention Obamacare. Unfortunately, the Republicans did far too little of it, but it's not like the President ran around focusing a lot on it either. A comment and then a, a final question. I don't know, I'm not skilled at the, how campaigns are run, but I would challenge your assertion. I think everyone, virtually everyone in this country, who voted in the presidential election in 2012 knew that one candidate, the president, would fight to maintain the Affordable Care Act and another pledge to repeal it. How much they did it in ads and in TV, I, I, I can't comment on that. I actually saw a lot of ads about the, the very subject in a battleground state of Virginia. But I think the voters knew exactly the positions of the two candidates on this issue. Um, and while it wasn't the only issue in the campaign, it was an important one. And they had that before them as they made the decision. The last question I would ask is really a little bit of a rhetorical one, but it's a sincere one. I very much hope that regardless of the outcome of this debate over the next few days, well, and, and I strongly want the outcome of this debate to be that government continues and that we continue to provide the services that we need to and that we save the debate about health care reform for another day. But I very much hope that you introduce legislation about health care reform ideas, that that legislation not be wrapped up with the question of whether government should shut down or not, but be standalone legislation, that it not be wrapped up with the question of whether we should default on our debts or not, but it should be standalone legislation. Because I have a feeling that there are many Democrats and Republicans that would love to work on reform ideas. In this body and in the House, we have a somewhat limited bandwidth. We're trying to deal with a lot of different issues. 
health care is a hugely important one and its connection to the economy is hugely important and i think there are a lot of members here who would love to have a debate about reform but for the last three plus years the only debate has been about repealing or defunding instead of about reform and and that makes it a fairly simple vote for many of us it, it makes it a simple vote for many of us who feel like the will of this body has been expressed that the supreme court has rendered an opinion about the affordable care act that the american public has rendered an opinion about two positions in a presidential election in two thousand and twelve uh, a defunding repeal strategy which has been now done four dozen times by the house is actually a pretty simple thing to move aside based on the foregoing but if we set aside those efforts and try to take up the kinds of concrete reform ideas that you talked about earlier i actually think there might be a number of things that we could all do together to improve the situation but we just don't need to do it while we're talking about the shutdown of the government or defaulting on america's bills for the first time in our history thank you mr president i yield the floor back well i appreciate the question from the senator from virginia and let me say i appreciate uh... the good faith and seriousness with which he approaches this issue and 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 other issues before this body one of the notable things three senators who are on the floor right now all of us are freshmen and one of the things i appreciate about this freshman class is all of us came in november to washington before we'd been sworn in as senators and we had a week-long orientation process and we went and we had dinners with our spouses we got to know each other as human beings that's something that doesn't happen very often in washington anymore it used to happen in, 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 in a bygone era but it doesn't happen much anymore and one of the interesting consequences that not many people have commented on but it's something that i find quite significant is the freshman and the freshman class there were far more democrats than republicans but to the best of my knowledge no freshman has spoken ill of another freshman I am not aware of it if it has happened. And I think part of the reason for that was spending that time together, getting to know each other as people. The Senator from Virginia and I disagree on a number of issues. And yet I hope and believe that we both understand the other is operating in good faith based on principles that we think are correct that's a foundation for actually solving problems and moving forward for this country and one of the unfortunate consequences is you see both sides of this chamber pummel each other is many of us don't even know each other one of the interesting dynamics from my perspective many of the senior democrats who frequently choose to say some fairly strident things directed at me many of them I don't really know I haven't had the opportunity to get to know them and I've had conversations with freshman Democrats asking the senior Republicans do you know them and the answer I've been told is not really we sit on committees but you most of us are on four or five committees you're running from one hearing to another you often run into a hearing you ask a few questions you run out you're off to the next meeting you're meeting with your constituents you're doing this you're doing that and you don't have an opportunity to get to know each other so I am hopeful that the goodwill that we've seen among the freshmen can spill over more broadly. But I want to say also on the point that the senator from Virginia made about reasonable and productive amendments to improve the system. Look, it's very difficult to have the sort of reforms I talk about with Obamacare in place because Obamacare has so dominated the health care market it has made government the chief mover and operator and you can't have positive free market reforms with Obamacare there they the approach I'm advocating doesn't work as long as Obamacare makes government the chief mover and operator and that is much the same as the situation in nations that have adopted single-payer socialized health care but I would note the senator from Virginia expressed an interest in positive reforms to address some of the most egregious aspects of health care 
I would encourage the Senator of Virginia, from Virginia to direct those comments to the majority leader of this body. Because the majority leader of this body has decided on this vote that we'll have one amendment and one amendment only, as far as I understand. That amendment will be funding Obamacare in its entirety. So the majority leader has decided we're not going to have amendments on the sorts of things that the senator from Virginia suggested, ways to improve the system. So, for example, the majority leader does not want an amendment, apparently, on addressing the medical devices tax. A large majority of senators in this body voted during the budget proceeding against the medical devices tax because we understand it is killing jobs, it is destroying innovation, it is one of the most punitive, destructive aspects of this bill. And yet the majority leader, as I understand it, said we're not going to have a vote on that. Why? Because that would actually affirmatively help fix things, and so we're not going to do that. I'm putting words into why, but that's the only reason I can think of. Another example, Senator Vitter's amendment to repeal the congressional exemption. Now, look, I understand many members of Congress don't want to be on the exchanges, don't want to lose the, our subsidy, don't want to have the same rules that apply to us that apply to millions of Americans. I understand that personally, but I think it is utterly indefensible for members of Congress to be treated better than the American people. I think we ought to have a vote on the Vitter Amendment, and I have stated before, I think it ought to be expanded so that every member of Congress, all congressional staff, the president, the political appointees, and every federal employee should be subject to Obamacare. They shouldn't be exempted. There shouldn't be a gilded class in Washington that operates on different rules than the American people. Now that would be a positive reform. Indeed, I would suggest it would be a populist reform. And yet the majority leader has said, no, we can't vote on that. Now I'm going to assume part of the reason is because having a debate on that on the merits, the position that Congress should have a privileged position is indefensible. Another example, House of Representatives has voted to delay the individual mandate. They've said, listen, if you're going to delay the employer mandate for big businesses, why treat big businesses better than individuals and hardworking American families? Let's delay them both. If you're going to delay one, delay them both. That passed a majority of the House, and indeed a considerable number of Democrats, I don't have the number in front of me, but a considerable number of Democrats in the House voted for that. The majority leader of the Senate has said, no, we're not going to vote on that. Yet another instance, we have all been astonished and dismayed by the abuse that's occurred in the IRS that's been made public, that's been admitted to. Quite a number of members of this body would like to see the IRS removed from enforcing Obamacare. Now that's a position a large majority of Americans support. Majority leader of this body, as I understand it, has said, no, we can't vote on that. We're not going to have that positive reform. We're not going to have a vote. We're only going to vote to fund it all. There are a great many amendments we could make that would make the situation better. And it is only because the majority leader has decided to shut down the Senate to not make this process work that we're not having those amendments. So I appreciate the senator from Virginia, and I would urge him to make those arguments to the leader of his party in this institution so that we can have full and open debates and vote on these amendments. Because this thing isn't working. It's fundamentally not working. And we need to respond to the American people. We need to listen to the American people, and we need to fix it. Now, at this point, Mr. President, I would like to return to reading some more tweets. And as the night goes on, I hope to read even more tweets. So I would encourage anyone that would like to see, note folks in the gallery who just waved. I'm not sure if they have their, well, they do have their electronics. Well, if you tweet, it may end up here, and I may have the chance to, to, to read it. If the hashtag make DC listen is in it. We don't want it, don't need it, and can't afford it. Please tell them to listen to its citizens. Make D.C. Li oh, I've done these. I need to get... They're good, but I don't want to... Okay, maybe it's just... Okay, here, I think these I have not done. It was just that page. Make D.C. listen. 
because we the people are on to you and will not stand for tyranny. Hoorah. I like that. Defund Obamacare. Because if I can't get a job now, what hope will I have later? Make D.C. listen. Make D.C. listen. Because it makes entry-level jobs disappear for young Americans. Make D.C. listen. Because I want to keep my own doctor. Defund Obamacare because we don't want government-run health care. Make D.C. listen. Obamacare is a job killer. We can't afford it. Make D.C. listen. Make D.C. listen. If it's bad for Congress, they have no right to force it on their constituents. Vote to defund it. I want my 40 hours. Make D.C. listen. Start listening to the people instead of who is lining your pockets. We are the ones who vote. Make D.C. listen. Oh, here is, a, here is a tweet from Greg Abbott, my former boss, the Attorney General of Texas, running for Governor of Texas, a very good man. Obamacare is destructive to our economy, to jobs, to liberty, and to health care access. Make D.C. listen. Thanks, boss. I appreciate it, and I agree. Make D.C. listen by committing to always cast your vote for those who do listen and act accordingly. Make D.C. listen, because government is too large already, period. Obamacare violates our rights. We cannot, as America, allow this solution to continue. Solutions in quotes. Make D.C. listen. Small business owner, if Obamacare is implemented, I will be forced to drop my group insurance for my employees. Make D.C. listen. When can the citizens expect our waiver? If everyone else is getting them, shouldn't we? Make D.C. listen. That's a great point. Why is it that President Obama treats giant corporations and members of Congress better than hardworking Americans? I think it's indefensible. And yet, this body right now, unless we act differently, is going to allow that status quo to continue. Saying senators should live by the same rules as American people should not be controversial. It should be obvious. Make D.C. listen. That's exactly right. Congress has exempted itself and staffers from the monstrous law for a reason. Don't we deserve the same? Make D.C. listen. Make D.C. listen. Americans are finally seeing what's in the bill, and we hate it. Thank you for standing up to the status quo in D.C. Senate phone lines are jammed. Start using fax, social media. Go to and it lists a private website for a list of Twitter accounts. Make DC listen. And I think that point, by the way, is really quite potent. That as effective as the phones are, and I think the phones are very effective, but there's email, there's Facebook, there's Twitter. There are an awful lot of ways for the American people to speak up and make DC listen. Today, the Cleveland Clinic saved my dad's life. Wow. U.S. Senate saved their jobs. Make D.C. listen. That's powerful. How can any American support a law that punishes success? That's un-American. Defund Obamacare now. Make D.C. listen. Defund Obamacare because it's a tax that was never read until it was passed. We, the people, demand representation. Make D.C. listen. Defund Obamacare because it will ruin our generation and will destroy America and the American dream. Make D.C. listen. Obamacare is destructive to our country. Defund Obamacare. Stand up for our freedom. Make D.C. listen. If Obamacare is so great, why is everyone not going to have it? Make D.C. listen. The Congress, President, and federal workers have forgotten they work for us and should have to obey the same laws and rules we do. Make D.C. listen. Make D.C. listen. My children cannot get full-time jobs because of Obamacare. 
Can't wait to see how much my premiums will go up during open enrollment. Defund Obamacare because it's not good enough for Congress. Make D.C. listen. The American people are screaming to stop Obamacare. Stop Obamacare is in all caps. Make D.C. listen. Leave us alone. Mr. President, at this point, I want to talk about the topic of rate shock. We all remember some three and a half years ago when President Obama told the American people that by the end of his first term, the average American family's health insurance premiums would drop by $2,500. The end of his first term, as we know, was last year. That hadn't happened. That has not been the effect. What has happened instead? Well, according to a Kaiser Family Foundation report in 2012, the average cost of premiums for family coverage has risen by more than $3,000 since 2008. Now, $3,000 compared to $2,500, that's a $5,500 swing. Mr. President, that's a big swing. That's a big impact for any hardworking American family. But you know who's impacted the most? Those who are struggling the most. Single moms, working one or two jobs trying to feed their kids, trying to put food on the table. You know, $5,500 a year, that's a real difference. And the consistent pattern, Mr. President, the people who are the biggest losers under Obamacare are the most vulnerable among us. They're young people, Hispanics, African-Americans, single moms, because they're the ones not getting jobs. They're the ones being laid off from their jobs. They're the ones being forcibly put into part-time work at 29 hours a week. They're the ones facing skyrocketing health insurance premiums. They're the ones losing their health insurance. Actuarial firm Oliver Wyman estimates premiums in the individual market will increase an average of 40 percent. The Society of Actuaries estimates an average premium increase of 32 percent in the individual market. The Obama administration unilaterally delayed the provision of the law that limits out-of-pocket payments, e.g. deductibles, co-pays, to $6,350 per individual or $12,700 per family. According to Avic Roy, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and writer for Forbes.com, quote, if you compare the cheapest plan on healthcare.gov to, cheap, to the cheapest, quote, bronze plan on the new covered California insurance exchange, premiums for healthy 25-year-olds will increase by 147%. A median of $183 on the exchange versus $74 today. And premiums for healthy 40-year-olds will increase by 149%. A medium of $234 on the exchange versus $94 today. And because California bars insurers from charging different rates based on gender, and so do Colorado, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Montana, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, and Washington. The war on young people's premiums will fare just as poorly for women in California and many other states. Despite Obamacare subsidies, many Americans will still be paying higher premiums in 2014 as a result of Obamacare. Even with a government subsidy, they're going to be paying higher premiums. For example, Americans earning as little as $25,000 will still pay more, even including the subsidies. The Ohio Department of Insurance, you know, Mr. President, we talked about it earlier, how every four years, both parties focuses rather intensely on Ohio. When it's a presidential year, when it's a swing state, suddenly Ohio is the center of the universe. You get to 2013, not a presidential year, and Ohio seems to command an awful lot less attention to this body. But what's happening in Ohio? Well, the Ohio Department of Insurance announced Obamacare will increase individual market health premiums by 88%. Mr. President, that's not a mild increase. That's not a percent or two. 88% is a big deal for a family that is struggling to pay the bills. In California, Obamacare is estimated to have increased individual health insurance premiums by anywhere from 64% 
to 146 percent. In Florida, Florida's insurance commission, Kevin McCarty, told the Palm Beach Post that insurance rates will rise by 5 to 20 percent in the small group market and by 30 to 40 percent in the individual market next year. Now, if the men and women of America can easily afford to pay an extra 30, 40 percent or in the case of California, an extra 146 percent on health insurance, then we don't have anything to be worried about. But you know what? When I travel home, that's not what the men and women of America tell me. That's not what Texans say. Texans say they are working hard to make ends meet. That their life has gotten harder because of Obamacare. You know, a constituent in Vidalia, Texas, wrote on September 19, 2013, quote, I decided to do some research on Obamacare insurance for me and my, and my husband since neither of us have any insurance. I used the calculator to calculate how much of, quote, affordable insurance would cost us. I had really hoped this might be our chance to get insurance. To my shock, and shock is in all caps, it would cost us $16,026, and this was for the silver plan, which only pays 70%. My husband is disabled and receives Social Security benefits, but they say he cannot get Medicaid for two years after he was approved. He has another year before he qualifies. He is 62 and I am 56, and we have been without insurance since he lost his job four years ago. There is no possible way to pay $16,026 from our take-home pay, plus have to pay an additional 30% cost on any health cost we may incur. This is not affordable health care. The crime of it all is that if my husband and I do not enroll, we will be fined. This is crazy. Please stop this madness. You know, I will pass on some more words from Texans. Today, we received the welcome news of support from several of our friends in the Texas legislature who are backing our effort to fund the government and to defund Obamacare. The Texas Conservative Coalition and 67 members of the Texas legislature re released a letter which I would like to read. It begins, Dear Senators Cornyn and Cruz and Texas members of the House of Representatives, representing the state of Texas with its 26 million people, we write at this most urgent hour for you to do all you can to defund Obamacare and fund the federal government. We have done all that we can to help stop Obamacare from harming Texans. Number one, we refuse to create the Obamacare health exchanges. And number two, we refuse to expand the Medicaid program under the false pretense of taking federal money now while burdening taxpayers with millions of dollars in new cost later. But some of the most pernicious parts of Obamacare can only be stopped at the federal level. Only you can stop the federal government from enforcing the individual mandate. Only you can stop the government from creating a new budget-busting entitlement that will drive up the cost of insurance around the country. Only you can stop federal bureaucrats from drafting and imposing thousands of pages of red tape. And only you can stop the federal government from destroying the quality of our health care system. Therefore, we applaud the action of the United States House of Representatives on Friday, September 20th, 2013, to pass a bill that defunds Obamacare and funds the federal government. Next, it is up to Senators Cornyn and Cruz to hold the line and make sure Democratic Senator, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid does not use procedural tricks to strip the defunding language from the House bill. I would note, and this is not in the letter, this is me speaking, I would note that's what the debate we're in the middle of right now. The vote on Friday or Saturday on cloture is going to be the critical vote of this battle in the Senate. If Republicans stand together, we can prevent Harry Reid from shutting off debate. We can prevent Harry Reid from funding Obamacare using 51 Democratic votes on a straight party line vote. But that's only if Republicans stand together. If Republicans instead choose to vote for Harry Reid, choose to vote for giving the Democrats the ability to fund Obamacare, then that too will be our responsibility. 
and each of us will, it will be incumbent on us to explain to our constituents why we voted to allow Harry Reid and the Democrats to fund Obamacare despite the fact that it's destroying jobs and hurting millions of Americans. Returning to the letter. We know that Republican senators will need continued support from the Republican-led House to prevent Democrats from funding Obamacare. Together, we can prevail. Remember the spirit of so many Texans who have fought much worse odds in the past. Stay strong, stay resolute, and do not give in. I am thankful, this is me now, and the letter has ended, I am thankful that my home state of Texas has such principled conservatives among its elected officials who have fought hard to resist Obamacare, and I'm very grateful for their support and their encouragement. Their leadership is the reason Texas has one of the strongest economies in the nation, is one of the fastest growing states in the nation. Texas is proof that conservative principles put to practice actually work and provide opportunity for the most vulnerable among us. There is a reason why so many people from all across this country are moving to Texas, because Texas is where the jobs are. And if you look across this country, Obamacare is killing jobs all over this nation. I want to look at the impact on my home state of Texas. Obamacare will devastate jobs, growth, and the economy. It hasn't even been fully implemented, and yet it's already hurting Americans, even those in conservative states that have worked hard to resist the influence of Obamacare. According to the advisory board's daily briefing, 15 governors are opposing Medicaid expansion. I applaud those conservative leaders, Governor Haley in South Carolina, Governor Walker in Michigan, Governor Jindal in Louisiana, Governor Bentley in Alabama, Governor Brownback in Kansas, and many others, but particularly Governor Perry in my home state of Texas. Texas leaders in the House and Senate and elected statewide have stood united to resist the influence of Obamacare in our state. But the tragedy is, even with their efforts, Texans still aren't exempt from its negative impact. Governor Perry, in March of 2012, said, quote, Obamacare will cost the state of Texas at least $27 billion over the next 10 years. Senator Jane Nelson, Texas Senator and Chair of the Senate Health and, Health and Human Services Committee, said in September 2012, Obamacare is the wrong approach to our health care challenges. It does more harm than good. It will hurt our economy, eliminate jobs, balloon the state budget, and perhaps most importantly, stretch to the limit our already overburdened health care system. Senator Nelson also observed Texas is a large, geographically diverse border state with challenges that are unique from other states. The one-size-fits-all approach of Obamacare is wrong for Texas. If given the opportunity, we can design an efficient system that better meets the needs of our citizens. In March of 2012, Senator Nelson observed, Obamacare creates more problems than it solves, ballooning the deficit, overwhelming our health system, and burdening employers at a time when they're just struggling to survive. In March of 2010, Senator Nelson observed, in Texas, I'm deeply concerned with the devastating impact of the federal health care reforms we'll have on our state budget. The Health and Human Services Commission estimates that it will cost up to $24 billion over a 10-year period. Considering our projected budget shortfalls for the upcoming legislative session will be somewhere between $9 billion and sixty. billion, that our Health and Human Services budget, which accounts for a third of the total spending already, will continue to consume precious resources that would otherwise be available for our schools, our highways, and other important services. I am concerned that the federal government's plan will jeopardize our efforts on the state level. One size does not fit all, especially in Texas. Our state government spreads more health care do dollars across more terrain than any other state. We have challenges across the, along the border in our rural remote rural areas and in our inner cities that are unique to our state, and our cost will be disproportionately higher. Now, Mr. President, one could perhaps listen to those and say, well, 
Those are conservative Republicans. We expect conservative Republicans to oppose Obamacare. But how about others? How about those who are not conservative Republicans? Well, Mr. President, on April 24, 2013, the United Union of Roofers published a press release opposing Obamacare because it jeopardizes their existing health plans. Their, health, their press release read, Roofers Union seeks repeal reform of Affordable Care Act, cites loss of benefits to members, harm to industry, and multi-employer health plans. Washington, D.C., the United Union of Roofers, Waterproofers, and Allied Workers International, President Kinsey M. Robinson, issued the following statement on April 16, 2013, calling for a repeal or complete reform of the President's Affordable Care Act. Now, let me note, this is not the unions calling for a slight adjustment. This is the unions calling for a repeal. Repeal the law outright. Quote, our union and its members have supported President Obama and his administration for both of his terms in office. So these are President Obama's supporters. These are the labor unions. But regrettably, our concerns over certain provisions in the ACA have not been addressed, or in some instances, totally ignored. In the rush to achieve its passage, many of the Act's provisions were not fully conceived, resulting in unintended consequences that are inconsistent with the promise that those who were satisfied with their employer-sponsored coverage could keep it. These provisions jeopardize our multi-employer health plans and have the potential to cause a loss of work for our members, create an unfair bidding advantage for those contractors who do not provide health coverage to their workers, and in the worst case, may cause our members and their family to lose the benefits they currently enjoy as participants in multi-employer health plans. For decades, our multi-employer health and welfare plans have provided the necessary medical coverage for our members and their families to protect them in times of illness and medical needs. This collaboration between labor and management has been a model of success that should be emulated rather than ignored. I refuse to remain silent or idly watch as the ACA destroys those protections. Let me read that sentence again because that is coming from the leader of a labor union that has supported President Obama in two elections. I refuse to remain silent or idly watch as the ACA destroys those protections. I therefore call for repeal or complete reform of the Affordable Care Act to protect our employers, our industry, and our most important asset, our members and their families. Mr. President, let me ask you right now. Do members of the Senate have concern for hardworking union members? Do members of the Senate have concern for the families of hardworking union members who are saying in writing, we supported the President, but this law isn't working? If members of the Senate were listening to the people, this letter would get our attention. If members of the Senate were listening to the people, Democratic senators and Republican senators would stand up and say, this thing isn't working. The IRS Employees Union doesn't want to be subject to Obamacare. The union representing IRS workers tasked with enforcing Obamacare vocally opposes participating in the law's exchanges. IRS union leaders provided their members with a form letter expressing concern with legislation to, quote, push federal employees out of the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program and into the insurance exchanges established under the Affordable Care Act. Now, Mr. President, I want to focus on exactly what happened here. The IRS Employees Union sent letters to their members, form letters, drafted to you and me, drafted to members of the Senate, where the IRS employees union asked the IRS employees, write a letter to your senators, write a letter to your congressmen, saying exempt us from Obamacare. Apparently, the IRS employees union believes Congress will listen to them. How about the American people? 
These are the men and women in charge with enforcing Obamacare. These are the men and women the statute gives the responsibility to go to every hardworking American and say, we are going to force you to participate in Obamacare. They don't want to be in it. Now, Mr. President, I would suggest that that's not an accident. They know exactly what they don't want to be a part of. And the fact that they have sent those letters ought to be a warning call that sounds from the high heavens. And yet another example, and this is an example I've made multiple references to tonight, is a letter from the Teamsters. Dear Leader Reed and Leader Pelosi, I would note neither Leader Reed nor Leader Pelosi, presumably on the House side or on the floor, neither of them are listening, participating in this debate. But here's the letter that was sent to both of them. When you and the President sought our support for the Affordable Care Act, you pledged that if we liked the health plans we have now, we could keep them. Sadly, that promise is under threat. Right now, unless you and the Obama administration enact an equitable fix, the ACA will shatter not only our hard-earned health benefits, but destroy the foundation of the 40-hour work week that is the backbone of the American middle class. Like millions of other Americans, our members are frontline workers in the American economy. We have been strong supporters of the notion that all Americans should have access to quality, affordable health care. We have also been strong supporters of you. In campaign after campaign, and this is directed to Majority Leader Harry Reid and Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, in campaign after campaign, we have put boots on the ground, gone door to door to get out the vote, run phone banks, and raised money to secure this vision. Now this vision has come back to haunt us. Mr. President, let me read that again. This is the president of the Teamsters describing the political efforts that members of the Teamsters all over this country have done to elect Democrats to the United States Senate and the United States House. And in his words, he said, because of Obamacare, their vision of supporting Democrats politically, now this vision has come back to haunt us. Uh, Mr. President, if that doesn't get the attention of men and women of this body, I don't know what does. The letter continues, since the ACA was enacted, we have been bringing our deep concerns to the administration, seeking reasonable regulatory interpretations to the statute that would help prevent the destruction of nonprofit health plans. As you both know firsthand, our persuasive arguments have been disregarded and met with a stone wall by the White House and the pertinent agencies. Now let me stop you there, Mr. President. The average American does not have the political sway that a major labor union like the Teamsters has. The average American especially does not have the political sway that a major labor union has with this president, a Democratic president, with a Democratic majority in the Senate. And yet the head of the Teamsters say that they have met with, been met with, quote, that their persuasive arguments have been disregarded and they have been met with a stone wall by the White House and the pertinent agencies. Mr. President, a powerful labor union with friends in high office, with stroke in Washington, is met with a stone wall? What do you think the average American is met with? Do you think the reception is more welcoming to the average American? Perhaps the average American doesn't even get to see that stone wall to be rejected. Doesn't even have a forum to raise those arguments to have them disregarded and rejected. The letter continues. This is especially stinging because other stakeholders have repeatedly received successful interpretations for their respective grievances. Most disconcerting, of course, is last week's huge accommodation for the employer community, extending the statutorily mandated December 31st, 2013 deadline for the employer mandate and penalties. Time is running out. Congress wrote this law. We voted for you. We have a problem. You need to fix it. The unintended consequences of the ACA are severe. 
perverse incentives are already creating nightmare scenarios. Nightmare. Nightmare. That's the words the Teamsters use, nightmare. Some Democratic senators object to the use of the word train wreck. Perhaps nightmare would be better. That comes from the Teamsters in writing describing what Obamacare is doing. Why are we here? You know, nightmare is fitting. It's past midnight. Why are we here? Because the American people are experiencing the nightmare that is Obamacare. And we need to help them wake up from this very bad dream. Teamster's letter continues. First, the law creates an incentive for employers to keep employees' work hours below 30 hours a week. Numerous employers have begun to cut workers' hours to avoid this obligation. And many of them are doing so openly. The impact is twofold. Fewer hours means less pay, while also losing our current health benefits. Mr. President, how does that sound? The majority leader told the American people on television that Obamacare is terrific. Now, fewer hours meaning less pay and losing your current health benefits, that doesn't sound terrific to me. It doesn't sound terrific to the millions of Teamsters, the millions of union workers, the millions of hardworking Americans who are experiencing the negative consequences of Obamacare. The letter continues. Second, millions of Americans are covered by nonprofit health insurance plans like the one in which most of our members participate. These nonprofit plans are governed jointly by unions and companies under the Taft Hartley Act. Our health plans have been built over decades by working men and women. Under the ACA, as interpreted by this administration, our employees will be treated differently and not eligible for subsidies afforded other citizens. As such, many employees will be relegated to second-class status and shut out of the help the law offers to for-profit insurance plans. And finally, even though nonprofit plans like ours won't receive the same subsidies as for-profit plans, they'll be taxed to pay for those subsidies. Taken together, these restrictions will make nonprofit plans like ours unsustainable and will undermine the health care market of viable alternatives to the big health insurance companies. On behalf of the millions of working men and women we represent, Mr. President, I would note he didn't say on behalf of the hundreds, on behalf of the thousands. He said on behalf of the millions of working men and women we represent and the families they support. We can no longer stand silent in the face of elements of the Affordable Care Act that will destroy the very health and well-being of our members, along with millions of other hard-working Americans. Mr. President, I want you to remember that phrase, we can no longer stand silent. I'm going to return to it in a moment. We believe that there are common sense corrections that can be made within the existing statute that will allow our members to continue to keep their current health benefits and plans just as you and the President pledged. Unless changes are made, however, that promise is hollow. We continue to stand behind real health care reform, but the law as it stands will hurt millions of Americans including the members of our respective unions. We are looking to you to make sure these changes are made. Signed, James P. Hoffa, General President, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Now, Mr. President, I don't have to remind anyone that the Teamsters, that Mr. Hoffa, are not loyal Republicans. They're not even disloyal Republicans. They have been active foot soldiers in the army to elect President Obama and to elect Democrats to this body. This letter describes Obamacare as a nightmare. This letter describes how it is hurting millions of Americans, including the members of their respective unions. And interestingly enough, this letter uses the same phrase, we can no longer stand silent, that the roofers union used, we won't stand silent either. Why is it? that both of these unions use that same phrase, I would suggest, listen. Everyone in this body understands politics. 
understand sticking with your team, dancing with the team that brung you. No union is, is eager to criticize President Obama. They've got too much invested in this administration. And there is a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on the labor unions. I can't imagine what the re repercussions were to Mr. Hoffa and to the Teamsters after this letter was sent. I am quite certain it did not produce joy and celebration in the political classes in Washington. I think it's quite striking, though, that both the Roofers Union and the Teamsters say we can no longer stand silent because the pressure is enormous. And let me tell you someone else, another group, that is right now standing silent that I hope can no longer stand silent. And that consists of elected Democrats in this body. You know, elected Democrats in this body, these union men and women knocked on doors, worked to elect many members of this body. If their union leaders can't stand silent, I would hope the politicians that pledge to fight for them won't stand silent either, that we would see what a remarkable thing it would be to see a Democrat have the courage of James Hoffa, to see a Democrat senator stand up and have the courage to say, you know, look, I supported Obamacare. That's what Mr. Hoffa said. I supported it at first because I believed the promise that were made. I thought this thing might work. But we've seen it hasn't. It's a nightmare. It's hurting hardworking American families. And Mr. President, any Democrat who did so could be certain to receive serious repercussions from the party. Political parties do not like it when you rock the boat. I can promise you Senator Lee and I have more than a passing awareness of that in our respective party. But at the end of the day, if you're responding to the American people, if you're listening to the American people, you're doing their job. And I hope in the course of this week that of the 54 Democrats in this body, that we see one, two, three, I hope we see a dozen have the courage that Mr. Hoffa showed. Have the courage to speak out about the train wreck, about the nightmare that is Obamacare, that is hurting Americans, that is killing jobs, that is pushing people into part-time work, that is driving up health insurance premiums, and that is causing more and more people to lose their health insurance. That's the courage we need. But you know what? It will not come from business as usual in Washington. It will not come from wanting to be popular in the conference lunches. It will only come from elected officials making the decision, the radical decision, to get back to the job we're supposed to do of listening to the people. Make D.C. listen. That's what we should be doing. Will the senator yield for a question? I'm happy to yield for a question without yielding the floor. Senator Cruz, as I've listened to your remarks, I'm reminded of many events throughout our nation's history. It's a storied history involving a lot of comebacks. A lot of instances in which the American people were up against a brick wall of sorts. In which a small group of Americans, often not just a minority, but sometimes a minority within a minority, faced a substantial obstacle. At the founding of our republic, at the moment of our independence, this involved a battle against what was then the world's greatest superpower. Even within our own continent, we didn't have unanimous support. Even among our own people, at times it was a minority within a minority who believed that the cause of independence was worthwhile, that it was worthy of the great effort that declaring independence and fighting a war for it uh, would inevitably require. And yet we persevered, we rallied together as a people, believing fundamentally that our cause was just, and it worked. We followed that formula many times when it's mattered. And we haven't backed away from fights when those fights were necessary. This may be one of those moments where even though those who are willing to fight against this law, those who are willing to take this effort, 
are not in the majority. We're in the minority. In this case, in a sense, we're a minority within the minority. It's still worth fighting. I want to commend my colleague, the junior senator from Texas, for his dedication, his commitment, his leadership on this issue. Senator Cruz has never shrunk from this. He has been willing to fight hard for it. He's been willing to speak his mind, even at moments when it was difficult, even at moments when many were suggesting that it couldn't be done or shouldn't be done. And you know what reminds me uh, uh, of um, other examples that we've seen over the years of senators who were willing to speak at great length. I see our pages who are here tonight, our pages who serve us well and who are willing to stay late at night working hard. And I'm reminded that uh, 27 years ago, I was a page. Uh, much like these who are serving us here today. And I remember a young senator then in his first term, his name was Harry Reid. I remember watching him speak at great length for 10, 12, I don't know, maybe 13 hours at a time. I'm not certain what the issue was at the time, but I know it was important to him. I know that it was an issue on which he was somewhat outnumbered. I know that I saw his colleagues approaching him. Some of them were quite critical of the effort in which he was engaged. And yet, he stood by his message. He didn't shrink from it because he had an inner commitment to the people he represented. And I respected that about him. I could tell he had that kind of tenacity. I watched, as I was a Republican page at the time, I watched my Democratic page colleagues, I watched as they brought him a lot of water, hoping perhaps that eventually uh, he would drink enough water that he, he would um, uh, decide that it was no longer in his best interest to continue speaking on the floor. And yet somehow he managed to stay speaking for, I don't know, 10, 12, 13, 14 hours at a time. And I have a great re deal of respect for what he did at that moment. And I hope that there's some aspect of Senator Reid that is able to sympathize with what Senator Cruz is going through, that's able to respect the great level of commitment that it takes to stand here hour after hour and engage in this discussion, a discussion that's important for the American people to have. Now, we all continue to hear from our constituents about some of the things that Obamacare might do. Some of the things that Obamacare might do to the people rather than for them. I received this one from James in Utah. James writes, Sir, as a retired U.S. Marine Corps gunny, I would like to express my view and ask that you vote to defund Obamacare. I'm part of the security team here at, and I've deleted the name of his employer, and our new contract has a massive increase in the cost for health coverage. I fought for the people of this country. Now I ask the same from you. Please help us. Gunnery Sergeant Charlie Jones, U.S. Marine Corps, retired from Utah. Then I hear um, comments like this from constituent after constituent, from people who will write in from throughout my state and, and from throughout the country. Stephen from Minnesota writes, Dear Senator Lee, please do all you can to stop the implementation of Obamacare. My work insurance went up 8.1% in January in anticipation of Obamacare. I make about $40,000 a year. We do not have any extra money after bills. I would like to see health care available to everyone. We've gone without health care insurance at times, but I believe that Obamacare is not the solution and will result in poorer quality health care overall and hurt our economy. Thank you for considering a Minnesota resident's concerns. Stephen, I'm happy to consider your concerns and I'm happy to share those with my constituents.
This next one comes from Kevin, who's from Massachusetts. He writes, Dear Senator, I strongly urge you to approve and vote yes on the House resolution bill passed by the House and is now before the Senate that fully funds the government and protects the full credit of the United States but defunds the Affordable Care Act as provided for in the bill and continuing resolution sponsored by Congressman Graves. It is unfair to exempt everyone with political connections from Obamacare and not to exempt the rest of us. You must understand that Obamacare is undermining American workers and selling out hard for union benefits. It is not fair for businesses to reduce workers' hours to survive. It is time to defund the Affordable Care Act until such time when it can be repealed and things can be straightened out and workers protected. I urge you, please, to delay funding for Obamacare now. That's Kevin from Massachusetts. When we look at these examples and we read other similar examples like them, from people writing from throughout my state in Utah, and people writing from throughout the country, we see a consistent pattern. Americans are justifiably, understandably fearful of losing their jobs, of having their wages cut, of having their hours cut, in some instances losing access to health care, sometimes to a health plan upon which they and their families have relied for many years. This is a difficult situation for them because health care is an especially unusually personal thing. Access to health care is something that people don't necessarily want to entrust entirely, entirely to their government. And yet that seems to be the direction in which Obamacare inevitably takes us. It puts more and more of our health care into the control of the federal government. And as has been suggested on the floor tonight, as some of my colleagues, some of my Democratic colleagues from within the Senate have acknowledged, this is but a step in the direction of what they hope will be a single-payer, government-funded, government-run health care system, funded, operated, administered entirely from Washington, D.C. Now, there are some things that government can do in the sense that there are some things that government is rather uniquely empowered to do. Providing, for example, for our national defense. And that's something that we do from Washington. That's a power that's entrusted to us by Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. With roughly one-third of the provisions of Article I, Section 8 being dedicated in one way or another to our national defense. That's something that Washington can do. It's something that Washington must do, and that Washington is rather uniquely empowered to do under our constitutional system. Health care is, of course, important, undeniably important. In many respects, it's as important as national defense. The fact that it's important doesn't necessarily make it a responsibility of the federal government, nor does it necessarily qualify the federal government as a practical matter, setting aside the constitutional question, doesn't necessarily qualify the federal government as an effective health care provider. Many people fear the day when our federal government becomes much more empowered over the very personal decisions of our lives, particularly those affecting our access to health care. Many people are also suspect of the new taxes imposed by this law, the new permutations that this law will introduce into the lives of the American people. We've discussed several times today the manner in which uh, this law was enacted, the manner in which it was introduced as a bill brought to the floor of the House of Representatives after then Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, informed her members that they needed to pass the bill and then they could find out what's in it. One of the things that we have not discussed as much is the f fact that even after that was passed, without members of Congress having adequate opportunity to review this legislation, even after that happened, 
And setting aside the 20,000 pages of regulations that have been added to this corpus of federal law up until this point, we've had two significant revisions of the law, revisions that were brought about not legislatively, but by the judicial branch of government. Revisions that the judicial branch of government had no authority to impose. I'd like to talk to you about both of those. When the Affordable Care Act was challenged as to its constitutionality, there were two primary constitutional challenges brought to the attention of the federal court system that ultimately made their way to the Supreme Court of the United States. One of those challenges involved a constitutional attack on Congress's authority to enact the individual mandate. The provision compelling individuals to buy health insurance, not just any health insurance, but that federal, that, that kind of health insurance that the federal government in its infinite wisdom deemed appropriate and necessary and essential, indispensable to every American everywhere. The argument presented in those constitutional challenges, culminating at the Supreme Court of the United States, was that Congress had, enacted, had acted pursuant to its authority under the Commerce Clause, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 of the Constitution, which empowers Congress to regulate commerce among the several states with the Indian tribes and with foreign nations. The argument said Congress does have power to regulate interstate commerce, and the Supreme Court has interpreted that power rather broadly since 1937. And yet, either, even under that extraordinarily broad interpretation of the Commerce Clause, so the argument went, Congress doesn't have the power to regulate inactivity. The failure to purchase health insurance is not an interstate commercial transaction. In fact, it's not a transaction at all. It's a failure to act. The Supreme Court of the United States accepted that argument and concluded that e even under the extraordinarily broad deferential standard of review used by the Supreme Court since 1937, this could not pass muster as a valid, legitimate exercise of Congress's Commerce Clause authority. The Supreme Court justices rejected that argument by a vote of five to four. Oddly, however, the Supreme Court went on to conclude that the individual mandate was nevertheless constitutional, not under the commerce power, but under Congress's power to tax. In essence, what you had was five justices of the Supreme Court, led by the Chief Justice of the United States, the Honorable John Roberts, who, as I see it, effectively rewrote the individual mandate provision as a tax, saved it only by recasting it as a tax or as a valid exercise of Congress's power to impose taxes. There are a couple of problems with that interpretation. First and foremost, Congress could have adopted a tax, could have imposed a tax as an enforcement mechanism to bring about compliance with the individual mandate provision. And yet, it decidedly did not. It used language that under at least a century's worth of jurisprudence was clearly, unequivocally, a penalty and not a tax. You see, there's a long line of cases that helps courts decide whether something is on the one hand a penalty or on the other hand a tax. And this was, under a century or more worth of jurisprudence, a penalty and not a tax. It's also important to note that the House of Representatives initially considered language that would have attempted to enforce compliance with the individual mandate provision by means of a tax, using language that under a century's worth of jurisprudence would have been regarded as a tax. Yet interestingly enough, and not surprisingly, that language was rejected. That proposal did not carry the day. That proposal could not carry the day. Why? Well, because most Americans 
understandably are reluctant to raise taxes on middle class Americans. It was soundly rejected. It could not carry enough votes. Even in the Congress in place during the first two years of President Obama's administration, a Congress that was overwhelmingly Democratic in both the House of Representatives and in the Senate. It could not carry the day. So the Constitution requires that revenue bills originate in the House of Representatives. If this was a new tax, it would have had to have originated in the House. In a sense, in a very significant sense, one could argue, the bill that ultimately became the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, did originate in the House. It came over here to the Senate. It had its provisions stripped out and replaced by Senate language. But many people still consider that a House bill. The problem here has a lot to do with the fact that the tax language did not originate in the House or in the Senate. It originated instead across the street. It originated instead across the street with five lawyers wearing black robes, who we call justices. Now those five lawyers wearing black robes, who we call justices, are no more empowered than the Queen of England to impose a tax on the American people. And yet they imposed a tax on the American people. This is not okay. This is not acceptable. This was a lawless act. This is something that we should be ashamed of as Americans. This was a sad, shameful moment when the Supreme Court of the United States took upon itself the mantle of a super legislative body, which it is not. Unable to bring about a massive tax increase on the middle class, the Congress adopted what it could. What it did adopt, the Supreme Court found to be unconstitutional on its own terms as it was written. The Supreme Court, apparently unwilling to do its job, and all too eager to do the job of the legislative branch, rather than acknowledging the unconstitutionality of that provision, simply resurrected it by rewriting it, by rewriting it as something that it is not, was not, and never could be. Interestingly, this was not the only insult to the Constitution in connection with that case. You see, in the same dispute in which the Supreme Court rewrote Obamacare in order to save it, in the same case in which the Supreme Court of the United States rewrote the individual mandate provision, as a tax, when in fact it was a penalty, they did something else. You see, a separate majority, an even larger majority, a seven to two majority, concluded that another aspect of the Affordable Care Act, as written, could not withstand constitutional muster. You see, the Medicaid expansion provisions left the states with no option, no alternative, no choice other than to accept a significantly expanded Medicaid program, a program that's administered by the states, that's partially funded by the federal government, but ultimately administered by the states. The Supreme Court of the United States, citing long-standing precedent, said this is not okay. You see, Congress doesn't have the power to commandeer the state's legislative and administrative machinery for the purpose of implementing a federal policy. Congress may not do that. It's not within our power. And yet, a large majority of the Supreme Court concluded that's exactly what Congress did in the Affordable Care Act. So faced with yet another constitutional problem, the Supreme Court adopted yet another rewrite, yet another rewrite that the Supreme Court of the United States was not constitutionally empowered to bring about. What the Supreme Court did in that circumstance was to just read in or write in an opt-out for the states so as to make it constitutional. Now, some have tried to defend this by saying, well, that's what courts do. When courts find that something's unconstitutional, they 
have to look a second time to see whether they can read into it a different interpretation that might be fairly possible, a fairly plausible interpretation that could allow them to save it. But here, there was nothing there. There was nothing that could allow them to do this. The court's job at that moment was to figure out whether or not the unconstitutional provision could be severed from the rest of the statute, whether it could be excised out sort of like a cancerous tumor, allowing the healthy tissue to remain with the cancerous tissue gone forever. There are rules, there are standards that the Supreme Court is supposed to follow when engaging in this exercise. And whenever it does this, it, it follows decades-old severability jurisprudence. Well. That standard, I believe, if followed, would inevitably have culminated in the Supreme Court of the United States finding that the Medicaid expansion provisions could not be severed from the rest of the statute, the other provisions in the Affordable Care Act. And I suspect that may well be why the Supreme Court did not engage in severability analysis. It instead rewrote the law. So the Supreme Court of the United States rewrote Obamacare, not just once, but twice, in order to save it. This is not okay. This is not constitutional. This is not American. Now, the, the next response that defenders of this law usually bring up is, well, it, it is, after all, the Supreme Court's job to decide what's constitutional and what isn't constitutional. So if they say it's constitutional, then it must be constitutional. And who is anyone else to second guess their judgment as to constitutionality. Okay, well, I understand that argument. That argument is fine, perhaps as far as it goes. You can't read too much into that statement. It's not fair to say that the Supreme Court is the sole expositor of constitutional meaning. It is true, of course, that within our federal system, the Supreme Court has the last word in deciding questions of federal statutory and constitutional interpretation for the purpose of deciding discrete cases and controversies properly before the court's jurisdiction. That, however, does not excuse the rest of us from independently exercising our own judgment. Nor is it the case that every constitutional infraction, every constitutional indiscretion is necessarily within the competence of the federal courts to resolve. In fact, there are countless circumstances in which either because the court might lack jurisdiction or because no plaintiff can be brought forward with Article III standing necessary to challenge the federal action in question or because the courts have recognized that there is a non-justiciable political question at stake, for whatever reason, the courts in a number of circumstances might not be competent to address a particular issue. In other circumstances, a case, for whatever reason, simply is not brought. In many, many circumstances, the courts don't have occasion to address a constitutional infraction. But regardless, we are never excused. We as senators of the United States, having taken an oath under Article VI of the Constitution, to uphold the Constitution of the United States, we're never excused from our responsibility to look out for and protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. And when we see an unconstitutional action, we need to call it out as such. And we, we need to do whatever we can to stop the Constitution from being violated. The Constitution was violated. The Constitution was distorted. The Constitution was manipulated. It was defiled, not once but twice, by the Supreme Court of the United States when the court rewrote the Obamacare Act, the Affordable Care Act, twice in this decision that was rendered at the end of June 2012. This is one of many reasons why I think it's important for us to have this debate and this discussion about whether we fully fund the implementation and enforcement of this law. A law that was never read by those who enacted it, a law that has become less popular rather than more popular subsequent to its enactment, a law that has now spawned some 20,000 pages and counting of new regulatory text, 
This same law was rewritten not just once but twice by a Supreme Court of the United States that openly flouted the Constitution of the United States, thumbed its nose at its own constitutional responsibilities. We're now being asked whether we should continue funding the implementation and enforcement of that act, and I think not. In addition to the unconstitutional rewriting by the Supreme Court of the United States, we've now have several instances in which the President of the United States has himself attempted to rewrite the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. The President of the United States has said that although enforcement of the employer mandate provision is set to begin on January 1st, 2014, that the President's administration will not implement and enforce that provision effective January 1st, 2014. Although the President lacks any constitutional or statutory authority to make this decision, although the President has neither sought nor obtained a legislative modification from the legislative branch of government, Congress, the President is treating the law as if it contained that modification already. There was another modification that took place with respect to the implementation of the out-of-pocket spending limits, the spending caps. This too was done without any legislative or any constitutional authority. And there was another modification that the President made with respect to proof of eligibility for, ex for, for subsidies on the exchange networks set up by the Affordable Care Act. All three of these modifications were made by the President without any statutory authority, and they were therefore extra constitutional modifications. Now, as I understand it, a few weeks ago when someone asked the President of the United States, why this was appropriate when somebody challenged the President of the United States with regard to his authority on these modifications. His response was something like this. Under ordinary circumstances, under more ideal circumstances, uh, perhaps I might have gone to Congress to get Congress to modify the statutory provisions in question. But these are not ordinary or ideal circumstances. I'm not sure exactly what he meant. But it sounds to me like what he was saying was, I'm in a tough spot, so I've got to do what I can do, what I can get away with, uh, because I've got a Congress that is now less cooperative, less inclined to cooperate with me, less inclined to do what I, as President of the United States, uh, want Congress to do, than the Congress that was in place in 2010 when the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was enacted into law. Well, that's interesting. It's interesting on a number of levels because, number one, one of the reasons why that Congress is now less inclined to be cooperative with the President, one of the reasons why the Congress is no longer as inclined to do the pre President's bidding is, interestingly enough, because of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, because of the widespread public outcry that came from across this country as a direct result of the enactment of this statute. It's not at all unusual to have a divided Congress. It's not at all unusual for one or both houses of Congress to be under the control of a party other than the President's own political party. And yet it has never been the case and can never be the case that there is somehow an exception to the Constitution, that there is somehow an exception to Article I's provision that all legislative powers granted by the Constitution shall be vested in a Congress consisting of a Senate and of a House of Representatives. The fact that the President finds political dissent within the Congress irritating does not make him a king. The fact that Congress won't always do the President's bidding does not vest him with the powers of a despot. And when someone holding the office of President of the United States purports to wield legislative powers, 
When the President of the United States purports to make law by the stroke of the executive pen, we have exited the territorial confines of constitutional government. These are some of the reasons why we have focused this debate back on Obamacare. People are frequently bringing up the argument, this is law, this is settled law. Because it is settled law, you must fund it. First of all, I am aware of no constitutional command that says that simply because a law has been adopted, Congress must fund any and every provision authorized under that law. In fact, quite to the contrary, because Congress holds the power of the purse, Congress may, Congress must continue to have the authority to decide what programs to fund and which programs not to fund. Were it otherwise, we would have a really strange set of circumstances in which one Congress could bind another Congress simply by passing a piece of legislation and, and not by constitutional amendment. That is not the case, never has been the case, never could be, should be, or will be the case under our constitutional system today. And so what we see is the fact that this is not simply a partisan political debate. Many are casting it as that. Many are pointing to the fact that we have some Republicans agreeing with some Democrats, but for the most part, we see widespread disagreement between Republicans and Democrats. But that dramatically oversimplifies the matter. This is no longer simply a dispute between Republicans and Democrats. In many respects, this represents a dispute between the political ruling establishment of Washington, D.C., on the one hand, and the American people, on the other hand. You know, one of the things that um, we're often told that we have to face here is that we have to choose to keep everything funded or we have to choose to fund nothing. It's a frequent source of frustration to many who serve in this body. It certainly has been a frequent source of frustration to me and to the three million people I represent from the state of Utah. It's odd that we find ourselves in a position to vote on a continuing resolution, one that funds everything in government or nothing in government. It's a frustrating exercise that we have to go through. Because of the fact that we've chosen to appropriate this way year after year, we basically have one opportunity to decide what we're going to fund in government and what we're not going to fund in government. I wish that what we could do is at a minimum a bare minimum, it should be a lot more than this, but a, at a bare minimum, to have two different debates, two different discussions, both starting from the presupposition that we fund nothing, but both culminating in funding or not funding something. One that would deal with funding for Obamacare, and another one that would deal with funding for everything else in government. It would be nice if Obamacare funding had to stand or fall on its own merits. If we were starting from zero when it came to providing Obamacare funding and we had to justify it, we had to make the case for it, we had to say let's prove to the American people why we ought to be funding the enforcement of this law, this law that will make health care less affordable rather than more in this law that's being implemented in a fundamentally unfair manner. I think that would produce a very different debate and discussion. But very often the way things work in Washington, the way continuing resolutions work, we're faced with a set of circumstances that don't really accurately reflect the way we make decisions in any other aspect of our lives. I sometimes am inclined to analogize this kind of continuing resolution spending to the following. This is a, a vast oversimplification, but you know, suppose that you lived in a very rural, remote area. 
Suppose that the closest town to where you lived was uh, at least 100 miles away, but there was one market, one grocery store, just a mile from your home. It was the only grocery store within at least 150 miles, let's just say. And one day, your spouse calls you as you're on your way home from work and says, stop at the store, we need bread, milk, and eggs. You go to the grocery store, and you find the bread, you put it in the cart, you find the milk, you find the eggs, you put those things in the cart, you get to the checkout counter. The cashier runs up those things, and then the cashier says, now, wait a second, you can't just buy these things. You cannot just buy bread, milk, and eggs. You say, well, why? Why on earth can I not just buy these three items? This is all I need. Well, this is a different kind of grocery store. This is a grocery store patterned after the United States Congress. And in order to buy bread, milk, and eggs, we're also going to require you to buy a bucket of nails and a half ton of iron ore. You can use our wheelbarrow to take it out of your car and uh, a book about cowboy poetry and uh, a Barry Manilow album. You say, I, I really don't want any of those things. And the cashier says, well, that's fine. Uh, then you don't get your bread, your milk, and your eggs. At that point, you as the shopper, not wanting to come home to a very disappointed spouse, are likely to say, fine, uh, even though I don't want the nails or the iron ore, with a cowboy poetry book, and I definitely don't want the Barry Manilow album, I'm going to buy those things because I can't buy the things I need unless I also buy those things. That's how we spend in the United States Congress. Whether we like it or not, and most of us really, really don't like it, that's what we're stuck with. And so that's one of the reasons why we're having this debate now. One of the reasons why I think it's appropriate for us to have this debate in connection with this, it's unfortunate in many respects that we tie something so fundamental to who we are as a country, so, something so essential to our ongoing existence as a nation, as national defense. It seems absurd that we should tie that to funding for Obamacare. And yet that's where we find ourselves because of the fact that we've been operating under a continuous string of back-to-back -back continuing resolutions uh, for the last four or five years. It's time for us to start breaking away from those false and ultimately ridiculous choices. It's time for us to demand more as a people from our Congress. It's time for us as a people to start to demand independent debate and discussion debate and discussion that far more closely reflects the will of the American people and their ongoing needs. If the United States Senate must choose between, on the one hand, standing with the long-standing interests, the entrenched interests of the political governing class in Washington, on the one hand, or on the other hand, standing with the American people, I hope I expect that we will stand with the American people. And if you ask any member how constituents are feeling about the Affordable Care Act, how constituents are feeling about Obamacare and its coming implementation and enforcement, the response you will get is that at best constituents are mixed, in many cases, they're apprehensive, they're uncertain, but overwhelmingly, you'll find a lot of opposition, opposition from people who are seeing those wage cuts, cuts to their hours, and cuts to their health care benefits. How long are we going to have to continue to hear these things before we act? Are we really, as a Congress, willing to just look at these things and say, yeah, well, bad things happen. Let's just allow them to happen. Are we willing to do that? Those who are Democrats, are they willing to do that saying, yeah, I know this law is not perfect, but it's, it's a speed bump that we've got to cross over uh, on our way to a single-payer system run by the health care system? 
as Republicans? Are we, are we really willing to endure that, saying, yeah, it's a train wreck, uh, but the good news is it, it might inure to our political benefit uh, if it kicks in? I hope we're not willing to do that. I hope we have not descended to such a shameful, uh, cynical low that we would be willing to allow those political interests to trump the needs of the American people who are calling out, crying out for help and for relief. Ultimately, as we think about our responsibilities as senators, as we think about our responsibilities as citizens, I hope that we will reflect from time to time on the fact that we've all taken an oath to uphold this document, this 226-year-old document, a document that I believe was written by the hands of wise men raised up by their creator to that very purpose, to help foster and promote what would become, what has become, the greatest civilization the world has ever known. To the extent that we respect and honor this document, to the extent that we follow it, to the extent that we defend it, we uphold it at every turn, to the extent that we consider it not just a responsibility of the judiciary, but also of the political branches of government, including our own branch, we have prospered as a country, and to the extent we will return to those practices, we will benefit directly as a result. And so, Senator Cruz, I have to ask you, as a constitutional lawyer, as one of our nation's preeminent appellate litigators, as one who has argued many times before the United States Supreme Court, and as one who clerked for the late Chief Justice William Rehnquist, and now as a United States Senator, how do you see this role, the, the, the role of what some describe as coordinate branch construction of the Constitution? What role does it play in this body? What role does the Constitution play in the United States Senate? Does it have a place? Or is that something that is supposed to be left to the nine men and women wearing black robes across the street who are lawyers and hold a different constitutional office than we do? Well, I thank my friend.